Hello everyone, as part of our Saving Lives webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Healthcare Communications, and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. My patient was resuscitated. Now what? I'm going to introduce you now to Christine Lux, who is our moderator today. Christine is a clinical educational specialist at Overlake Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. She facilitates patient care services and hospital-wide orientation for nurses. She's a content expert for hospital-wide cardiac policies and procedures. And prior to Overlake, she was a cardiology clinical nurse specialist at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. And she was also a co-chair of the Code Blue Committee. And as well, Christine has facilitated and developed the educational plan for the development of the Surgical Airway Code. Christine, welcome. And I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session. And we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? I am, Emily. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Emily, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is, My Patient Was Resuscitated, Now What? Speaking today on this very timely topic is a colleague of mine, Nicole Kupchik. Nicole has practiced as a critical care nurse for over 20 years. Fifteen years ago, she began working at Harborview Medical Center, a trauma level one center in Seattle, Washington. Working in, in this environment spurred an interest for Nicole in resuscitation. Shortly thereafter, Nicole was part of a multidisciplinary team that was one of the first in the United States to implement therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest. As part of this effort, Nicole was responsible for protocol development and has published numerous papers on the topic. In 2013, Nicole founded Nicole Kupchik Consulting and Education. Nicole has disclosed the following affiliation. She is on the Speakers Bureau for Physio Control, Stryker, Medtronic, and Malakrat. She is a consultant for Physio Control and Stryker. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. As you can see, the accreditation statement is disclosed on this slide. A link to obtain CE credits will be available at the conclusion of this webinar. Support for this educational activity is provided by Physio Control. It is now time to hand over the webinar to our expert, Nicole Kupchik. Nicole, take it away. All right, good morning everyone. I'm coming to you from rainy Seattle, Washington, and I have a lazy dog who's sitting in the background snoring, so if you hear something weird, that's him. His name's Bailey, but anyway. All right, so welcome. I'm super excited to chat with you guys about this. Um, so sadly, this is the last webinar in our four-part series, but, um, but it's been kind of fun. We've had just insane, crazy attendance, so just want to thank everyone who's attended, but this is what we're going to talk about this morning, so kind of a little bit of a different view. We're going to talk about post-rest care, so your patient gets herself so then what do you do? Um, so we're going to talk about the guidelines from AHA um, that were published two years ago. Uh, we're going to talk about um, different criteria for the cath lab. Now I'm not going to go really deep into that because we, um, I did a webinar back in October where we did speak about this specifically, but I'll just kind of show you guys what the guidelines say. We're going to talk about oxygenation hemodynamic targets and then finally the big thing is we're going to talk about um, saving the brain and how do we do that. And, you, and what we do, the way we are able to do that is with targeted temperature management. So that's what we're going to chat about this morning. So, so just as a reminder, again, I can't say enough how important it is to have a system of care in resuscitation. You know, if, if your EMS is doing an amazing job, like the EMS system where I live in, you know, Seattle, Washington, King County, if they're doing an amazing job, but at the hospital, maybe we're not kind of following all the guidelines and doing evidence-based practice, you know, it, it just, the patient's not going to have the best outcome. And conversely, if your EMS system is having trouble or if patients aren't getting bystander CPR, it's not going to um, fare well for the patient. And so it's, it's such an important idea that we really think about resuscitation as a system of care, and every link in that system is very, very important. So what I want to do is let's specifically focus on post-cardiac arrest. And so this is the algorithm from the American Heart Association that was published in 2015. And so a couple things you can kind of see what they're focusing on. So obviously um, we need to optimize ventilation and oxygenation. I'm going to give you some specific targets on that in just a minute. Hypotension is absolutely detrimental in this patient population and so you have got to avoid hypotension. Um, another thing we should be asking is should this patient go to the cath lab? So we absolutely should be getting 12 lead ECGs after their arrest and asking the question is it appropriate to go to the cath lab? Do 
we think this is a cardiac cause. And then finally, protecting the brain by managing the temperature. So this is where we're going to focus. All right, let's get started. So the first question, should the patient go to the cath lab? So um, it's a class one recommendation, which is the highest recommendation you can have from AHA to get a 12 lead ECG. So that's kind of a big no-brainer. And um, if the ECG has ST elevations, go to the cath lab. There's no question asked about that. But um, one of the other things that HA is saying is that you should go to the cath lab regardless if your patient is awake or comatose if they do have ST elevations. And it's very common in our facility. We'll take patients to the cath lab if they have ST elevations, even if they're getting cooled and we're, um, they're not responding to us. So we don't let that uh, really alter our decision making for going to the cath lab. But you guys might remember from one of the, the webinars I did back in October that um, not everyone's got not ST changes on their 12 lead ECG, but yet many of them still need cardiac intervention. And so, again, this is just a reminder, a case series showed that 58% of patients post-cardiac arrest don't have ST elevations, but they still need PCI. And so um, I'm going to show you actually an example of a patient that I took care of um, a couple years ago. So this was a 54-year-old male who had a V-fib arrest. We were doing targeted temperature management, so the temperature was down to 33.6 degrees. Um, vitals were stable, and this was the 12-lead the post-resuscitation. So is there anything on this 12-lead that says, take me to the cath lab? And really, there's not. You know, I mean, if you look, there's some peak P waves, but that, that's not going to initiate a cath lab activation. What we're looking for is ST elevations. And so this, was, this ECG was immediately after after the arrest. Now check this out, three hours later, look what the patient does. And so um, you can see if you guys look in leads two, lead three, and AVF, these are our three leads that look at the inferior wall, the left ventricle, the patient's ha actively infarcting. And so again, you have to remember, patients don't have a cardiac arrest for no reason. You've always got to ask why. And you should definitely be asking the question, do we think this is cardiac in nature? And to be honest, most V-fib arrests are cardiac in nature. So, you know, you should really be thinking of, you know, kind of a th low threshold of taking these patients to the cath lab, but also just asking the question, is it appropriate? So, okay, so let's keep going. So, hemodynamic goals. Um, bottom line, hypotension is horrible in this patient population. So, there haven't been any randomized control trials, only observational data, but um, there have been three studies um, ranging from 2008 to 2014, all associating a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 with worse outcomes. And it's amazing to me how many facilities still use systolic of 90 as kind of a benchmark or goal blood pressure in a lot of these patients. Um, I want you to think about this. Okay, so my mom, my mom's got really bad um, hypertension. She, I always ask my mom, mom, you take your meds? What does she say? Yeah, I take my meds. She doesn't take her meds, right? And so my mom normally runs 160s over 90s. And if you were to wait until, you know, have a threshold of 90 systolic to treat her in any situation, sepsis, cardiac arrest, whatever it is, she's not going to have a good outcome. And so one of the things we need to really start thinking about is targeted, customized blood pressure goals for patients. And, and we're definitely leaning toward the mean arterial pressure versus the systolic pressure. But this was an, a study, now this is quite an old study, um, but it was specifically done in stroke patients um, showing that, um, when, I'm sorry, not stroke patients, it was published in the stroke uh, journal, but um, showing when the MAP was above 100 for the first two hours after return of spontaneous circulation, or ROSC, that was associated with much, much better neurologic outcomes. And then David Gajewski, who's out of Philadelphia, has actually done some research in kind of um, a, a bundle of care, and one of the elements in the bundle is to keep the map greater than 90, then of course, you know, targeted temperature management, etc. And he found better outcomes when the map was above 90. So, you know, I think we really need to, the question you should be asking as a um, clinician is, what is our blood pressure target? And, you know, and just kind of keep in mind, 90 is probably too low for a lot of patients. So, um, but we'll see. Now, I know one of the things that is happening is there is going to be an ongoing randomized control trial where they're looking at different blood pressure targets. So this is ongoing. You'll find this trial on clinical, um, oh, what's it called, clinicaltrials.gov. And, um, and they're going to be looking at different blood pressure targets, specifically in the post-cardiac arrest uh, patient population. So hopefully in the next year or two, we will have a better answer of where exactly we should be running uh, blood pressure. But bottom line, hypotension is bad. You should absolutely avoid it. So what do the guidelines say? The guidelines say specifically, avoid and immediately correct um, a systolic less than 90 or a MAP less than 65, 
The goal map should likely be greater than 65 to 80 millimeters of mercury, and so they give that a um, class 2B recommendation. And then again, just think about what would be okay for this patient. So my mom's chronically hypertensive. Would you know a map of 60 or 65 be okay for her? Probably not. And then one of the other things we know is we don't know exactly the best target for urine output, um, SVO2 or saturation of venous oxygen or cardiac output. So, and especially when you're implementing targeted temperature management and taking the temperature down, you're going to see lower cardiac outputs because the metabolic demands are so low. So honestly, we don't know exactly where we should um, run cardiac output, but bottom line, hypotension is bad, so you must avoid it. Okay, now one of the other things you can consider, and I again, um, I, I uh, presented this idea in a previous webinar, but the idea of using capnography as an indicator of kind of worsening cardiac output. So um, you get your patient resuscitated, one of the things you can do is keep the capnography connected to them. And if you're seeing a drop in their end tidal CO2, that's likely a sign of a drop in their patient's cardiac output. So um, that could be something that could really alert you to some to danger in a patient. So if you've got an end tidal CO2 that's dropping below 30, the whole idea is maybe you can intervene and, and um, prevent a uh, re-arrest. Because you, you all know, you've had patients in the hospital that have cardiac arrest and it's not uncommon for them to re-arrest. And so if you can intervene early and possibly mitigate a re-arrest, that would be the ideal situation. So, all right, oxygenation. So let's chat about this. So we all think oxygen is great. You know, more must be better, but actually it's not. So um, so when and we're learning this in MI, stroke, and cardiac arrest. And so there is this idea now that you should not be running patients hyperoxemic. You should only use oxygen when patients need it. Now, the European Society of Cardiology um, uh, re released the new STEMI guidelines, and they went as far to say is avoid oxygen. Only use oxygen in a STEMI, you know, if the um, SATs are less than 90. What our guidelines say, actually I'll go over our guidelines in just a second, but they say to use 100% um, FiO2 um, until you get ROSC. But this was an interesting study published in 2010 showing when you run patients, so this is a, um, just so you guys will kind of orient you to this um, graph over here, but this is what's called a survival curve, and so if everyone lives, the line's going to be way up here. If everyone dies, the line would be way down here, and so you can see when you look at these survival curves of comparing keeping the oxygenation normal versus running patients on the high side, there's definite benefit and higher survival in running patients with a normal oxygen level, so you should avoid hyperoxia or blasting patients with oxygen, um, especially after after a cardiac arrest. Um, so hyperoxia is associated with, with worse outcomes, and one of the thoughts is that it lends to oxygen-free radical production and worsens neurologic injury. In STEMI, there's thought that it maybe um, worsens the infarct size. Um, and the same in stroke. So really, oxygen, think about it as a drug. And you only should use what you need. You should not be using more. So always keep that in mind. OK, so what do the guidelines say specifically around oxygen? So they say avoid hypoxia. And that we know that if patients are on hypoxic, that's associated with worse outcomes. But um, so but what they do say is just use oxygen to maintain your SATs um, at 94%. Um, that's a class 2A recommendation. But of, again, avoid hyperoxemia. Okay, so now many years, so how many of you out there, and I know I can't see you answering the, answering this question, but how many of you out there have been practicing for more than, let's say, 15 years? And if you have been practicing for more than 15 years, um, you know that we didn't have a lot to offer patients after their cardiac arrest. So this is um, the, uh, the uh, chain of survival for cardiac arrest. And so the whole idea is kind of in that pre-hospital phase, bystander CPR, call 911. Um, the you know, 911 operator should be giving recommendations on um, a CPR. They should be guiding CPR. Um, we know we need to defibrillate early. We know we need to get these patients to the hospital. But it's, you know, interestingly enough, um, you know, I'll just tell you, taking care of these patients for years and years and years, this is the best we had to offer. You guys ready? So here's what we had to offer. Here goes my graphic. 
cross your fingers and hope for the best. That's what we had to offer patients post-arrest. We would just kind of cross our fingers and hope they woke up. But in 2002, two studies were published. Um, the first one that I'm kind of um, uh, kind of putting my mouse over is uh, was called the HACA trial, or hypothermia after cardiac arrest. The second one was out of Australia, and they were published on the same day, February 21st in 2002. And, um, and what these studies showed is that um, there is brain injury that happens post-arrest. So the whole idea is taking the body temperature down might be neuroprotective to these patients and save the brain. So let's kind of take a look at this. So these were the two randomized control trials. So again, the one was called HACA, hypothermia after cardiac arrest. Um, the other one was the, what's been called the Bernard trial. Um, Stephen Bernard is, was the lead physician on that study. And these were both multi-center trials, one in um, Europe, one in Australia. Australia. They both um, evaluated ventricular fibrillation. So these were VFib and VTAC arrest. They were out of hospital cardiac arrest, and you can see how many patients were in each study. So the HACA trial had 275, and the um, Bernard trial had 77 patients. And um, what they found was when you, so just to kind of orient you to this busy slide here, is um, this is the, this, um, kind of column is for the patients who received hypothermia. So what they did was they took the body temperature down to 32 to 34 degrees for 12 to 24 hours. And then in the control group, they didn't do anything interactive. So they did nothing active to control the temperature. And what they found, all statistically significant, was that the group that received hypothermia had much better outcomes than the control group where they didn't do anything. And so again, this was all statistically statistically significant. And so the whole idea was that, you know, inducing um, hypothermia 32 to 34 degrees was neuroprotective. Now the HACA trial actually looked at outcomes out to six months and they still found benefit even six months later in the group that received what was then called therapeutic hypothermia. And so this really honestly changed the landscape of the way we treated post-arrest patients. And I was super lucky to be involved in the very first um, protocol that was written in the United States. And you know, it was, it was fascinating. Just, uh, I will tell you, fascinating taking care of these patients because there was no rule book on what, what you should do or what these patients would look like and it literally was every patient we had we were taking notes on what we saw and, and things that happened with them and just really trying to hone our protocol so it was really I have to say as a nurse super cool to be part of something so revolutionary and so um, so anyway, that's why I'm just so passionate and super excited to talk about this but this is a picture from the HACA trial so this was the one in Europe and um, and you can see they, they used some kind of archaic devices back then, but but you have to think back to 2002. We didn't have a lot of different devices we could have used, but um, but you can see here what it is. It's the patient's almost in like this sleeping bag type device that blew um, uh, it kind of forced cold air over the patient's skin. Now, a couple things to note in the HACA trial. So I'm going to kind of highlight this: is that it took on average the median time to get cooling started was 105 minutes. So it took almost two hours to get the t um, targeted temperature management started and then it took um, almost eight hours to get the to the goal temperature and I want you to kind of remember this because a lot of um, people have this idea that we need to get these patients cooled as quickly as possible and need to get them to goal temp as close as soon as possible but interestingly enough this study you know, it took 105 minutes to get cooling started and eight hours to get to cool temperature and they still saw benefit. So I think the bottom line is we don't know exactly when cooling should be started or the, the right time to get to cool temperature, but we think that probably waiting too long is not a good thing. So so what is too long? And I'll be honest, the answer is we don't know. Um, I've asked experts this question over and over and over again. And a lot of people think if you, you know, if you wait more than six to eight hours, um, then it's probably too long to really see the benefit from um, from the therapy. So why cool? Well, one of the things we know is that when you have a cardiac arrest, your brain goes without oxygen. It's completely depleted of oxygen. But actually what a lot of experts think that it's actually when you reperfuse the brain that all the injury occurs. And so what we do know is that immediately during the cardiac arrest, your brain tissue is depleted of oxygen and glucose. You get this big influx of calcium and we know there's this formation of oxygen-free radicals. And you all probably know oxygen-free radicals are 
are very damaging to tissue. There's also this release of glutamate. So glutamate is a, um, it's a neurotransmitter that's an excitatory neurotransmitter. And too much glutamate almost like excites cells to death. And bottom line though what happens is, is patients will get mitochondrial injury and all of this leads to apoptosis or programmed cell death and cerebral edema. So the thought is maybe controlling the temperature can really minimize a lot of this reperfusion injury that these patients are experiencing. And so I want to give you guys a visual of what this might look like. So this is a CT scan of a patient that we had at our hospital um, before 2002. So this is before we were um, managing temperature in patients. And so this was a 30-year-old woman who had a cardiac arrest. We had no idea the etiology of her arrest, but we did a CT scan. Now I'll tell, so if you can, let me just paint the picture for you. She comes in through our, our emergency department. They got her resuscitated. She's intubated, so she's um, got a breathing tube. She's on a ventilator, but she's, from a neurologic standpoint, She's not responding at all. And so what we did was we, do a, we did a, um, a head CT on her. And her head CT immediately after her cardiac arrest was normal. So you can see she's got good gray-white matter differentiation. There's no edema. You can see you know, her ventricles. Everything looks normal. Now, what happened was a day and a half later, we repeat her CT scan. So what I want you guys to do, fix your eyes on this CT. OK, now. I'm going to flip to a day and a half later. So check this out. A day and a half later, she loses that gray-white matter differentiation. She gets massive cerebral edema. Her ventricles are collapsed. And we went on to pronounce her brain dead. And so again, she had her arrest before we had an option of managing temperature to offer. And um, what we found historically is a lot of these patients got extremely febrile. And we think that that also contributed to a lot of the neurologic injury that we've seen. And so, um, again, you know, I, like I said, I feel so lucky to have been part of one of the very first protocols that was ever um, implemented in the United States. And so, we published our outcome. So, uh, we, again, we're not going to do a randomized control trial. We believe in this therapy. And so, what we did was we published a before and after comparison. And um, to orient you to the side, so on the left side here, so if you look at graph A, Graph A, we specifically looked at the outcomes of patients who had a ventricular fibrillation arrest. And one of the things you can see is that our survival went from 38% before we did um, a therapeutic hypothermia, and then it jumped all the way up to 54% after. And so this was statistically significant. We saw a huge improvement in our outcomes. And then where we got kind of the biggest bang for our buck was an improvement in neurologic outcomes. Because again, you don't want to resuscitate these patients and do all of this, you know, kind of this, these uh, therapeutic interventions for, you know, only to send patients to nursing homes where they have no idea where they are or what day it is. And you want to get them back to meaningful um, life. And so that was what we were seeing. Now, um, we also looked at PEA and asystole. We were not powered by any means to answer the question, does cooling help in PEA and asystole? Um, you know, so we, you know, we didn't see anything that was statistically significant. But again, we weren't harming patients, and I think that was one of the things we were able to see from this, is that we don't think we were harming patients either. So um, we have um, historically done targeted temperature management or therapeutic hypothermia in every arrest, PEA, asystole, VFib, VTAC. Now, who has studied VFib and VTAC, but again, um, we found no harm in cooling PEA and asystole. Okay, so who should be cooled? Well, let's be a purist. Where does the um, where does the evidence lie? So the evidence lies in out of hospital ventricular fibrillation and VTAC. So that's where those are the patients that have been studied: out of hospital VFib, VTAC. Um, but what about PEA asystole? What about in hospital cardiac arrest? You know, what about drownings? What about cardiac arrest from um, electrocutions or asphyxiation? And again, we just don't have good evidence on these patient populations. Um, you know, so it, it's reasonable to consider cooling or target, do, using target temperature management for these patients, but they've not been studied in a randomized controls trial. So the bottom line is we don't really know. And so do we think we're causing harm? I mean, I, I don't think so. There was a, a paper by Paul Chan that was published um, 
in, oh gosh, it's, I think it's published last year, where he did kind of a retrospective view of over 1,500 patients and didn't seem to be as favorable for in-hospital cardiac arrest. But again, they've never been studied in a randomized control trial. So bottom line, I don't think we totally know. Now, um, what about kids, you might ask? So um, the THAPCA trial, so THAPCA stands for Therapeutic Hypothermia after Pediatric Cardiac Arrest. So this was a multi um, multi hospital study that was done in the US and Canada and what they did was they um did a therapeutic hypothermia after an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in, um, in pediatric patients who remained unconscious. And so the age range uh, ranged from two days old to eight, uh, less than 18 years old. And so what they did was they compared 33 degrees to 36.8 degrees. They um, evaluated 295 patients and then also evaluated survival at 12 months. And um, one of the things about this study that I think is interesting so a couple things is that um, patients in the hypothermia group um, receive CPR um, within three minutes. In the normal thermia group, it took about two minutes. So they got CPR a little faster in the normal thermia group. Um, other things to identify is um, the outcomes. So when you look at the outcome data, alive at one year, 38% of the pediatric patients who received hypothermia were alive at one year versus 29%. Now, this was deemed to be statistically insignificant because they were looking for a huge effect size. And I that's, that was one of the things like I really questioned when I read this study was they were looking for over a 20% effect size. And I, I think in this patient population, that's really unreasonable to expect that big of an effect in a, the pediatric population. Now remember, these are not primary cardiac arrest or cardiac etiology patients. Does anyone know, especially in the younger pediatric group? So if you look at at like kind of younger, you know, less than a couple years old, does anyone want to guess what the etiology of most of those arrests are? And it's respiratory. And so, um, so if you look at the statistics, 38% versus 29%, there seemed to be definite benefit in the um, hypothermia group. However, because they were looking for such a big effect size, they didn't reach statistical significance. And, um, and I honestly, I find this to be really tragic and just um, really, I think just very, devastating to this patient population and so you know one of the things the author says that a larger trial might have detect detected or rejected a smaller um, intervention um, effect and I completely agree with that or maybe not maybe have a more reasonable effect size but um, I've asked a lot of experts in the pediatric world okay so based on this study are you still cooling? In almost every pediatric center that I've asked have said, yes, we are still cooling these patients. So, um, so I don't know. So it's, it's kind of an interesting, um, interesting idea. So, all right, next question. How should you manage the temperature? And so the kind of uh, the things we have um, available would be catheters, esophageal devices, so they're the devices that go down the esophagus, or surface cooling. And I want to be really careful about the definition of surface cooling because in a lot of these studies, they've lumped like ice packs and fans and, and really basic water blankets into surface cooling. And I think there really needs to be a differentiation of what surface cooling means. And so to me, a surface device is any device that is placed on the patient's skin but has a biofeedback loop um, monitoring the patient's temperature. So the whole idea is you would take a temperature probe, ideally esophageal uh, or, or a, a esophageal or bladder probe, and you would connect that temp, that continuous temperature me measurement into the device that you're using to cool and then the whole idea is that the device would warm or cool the water circulating in these devices to keep the temperature normal. So I want to be super clear. When I say surface, I don't mean ice packs. Ice packs are a disaster. They, um, you know, you get overshoot of temperature, you get huge variability of temperature, you cannot stay in the right range. So just let's be super clear on that. Surface means I've got a temperature probe hooked into the device and I'm controlling your temperature. So what, do, what does the research show? And I'm going to be really honest. There have never been any really good trials um, pitting these head to head. And so um, there was a study that was published by um, a physician called Dr. Day where they compared a catheter to ice packs and 
fans and things like that. And interestingly enough, they really didn't find a big difference. There um, now they're saying it wasn't didn't quite reach statistical significance, but there was a um, trend toward improvement in neurologic outcomes. You know, at the three month mark. But the bottom line is, what should you do? I would say don't do ice packs. I think that's um, a pretty reasonable thing to avoid. Um, but um, I you know I think you need to do whatever works for your facility. So bottom line, what should you do? What works for your facility? Um, so if you if catheters work great for your facility, if you've got someone that can put them in, awesome. Works fabulous. Um, I know uh, in our facility we tried catheters a few years ago and we just could not get a provider to get them put in in a reasonable amount of time. So we ended up going back to surface. Now esophageal is kind of the new, um, kind of one of the newer ways to. Um, manage temperature. But bottom line, when you look at the data, you have to do what works for your facility. So far, nothing has been shown to be superior over the other, except we know we probably should not be using ice packs. So there you go. All right, Emily, we're going to do a polling question. So you ready, Emily? I am. I'm launching okay. it right now. All right, so let's get the audience involved. And so I want to ask you guys, what would be some common side effects of mild hypothermia? So that would be 32 to 40, uh, 34 degrees. So what would be some common side effects? Would it be bradycardia? Would it be diuresis, hypokalemia, meaning a low potassium, um, decreased medication clearance, or all of the above? So what do you guys think out there? I love it. You guys are totally right. So actually, everybody's right here. Everyone wins a trophy this morning. So, so anyway, but yeah, you're right. It's all of the above. So all of the above. Absolutely. So um, one of the things, and I will tell you, just um, when we launched this therapy, oh my, we had no idea. Because remember, there was like no rule book about this, right? And so we'd see patients get heart rates down to like the high 20s, low 30s. It was really scary. But a lot of them were um, hemodynamically stable because there's so much vasoconstriction from the cold. Um, diuresis, so you've got to make sure you stay up on the patient's fluids. Um, when you cool patients, um, potassium shifts out to the cell. When you rewarm them, it comes back into the serum. So you've got to really watch your potassium and replace it during therapy, but make sure you stop replacement when you're rewarmed. And then one big thing is we know we need to use really, uh, you need to really consider lower doses of medications um, when patients are getting cooled. So um, all of the above is the correct answer, Emily. So I love it. These guys are smarties out there this morning. So, all right. So let's keep going here. All right, so shivering. Shivering is a gigantic issue in this patient population. Whether you're um, uh, cooling to 32 to 34 degrees or if you've switched to 36 degrees, shivering is a gigantic issue. And so a couple things is, A, number one, if you're going to do this therapy, you need to have a protocol for it. Um, one of the things that I know we've done that's been pretty successful is we'll use like a forced warm air blanket over the patient's skin to kind of trick the thermoreceptors on the skin into thinking the patient's warm. Um, other things. Magnesium can be super helpful. Um, boost par, boost per own, um, can help with shivering. The only thing about boost par, boost per own is it has to be given down a feeding tube and gut motility is not the best in these patients. So, um, so anyways, but you'd have to do that at the beginning of your protocol. Um, we've been using more and more IV acetaminophen um, or Ofermev to um, uh, kind of counteract shivering. Um, other things, uh, maybe a sedative, propofol or dexmedetomine, but one of the challenges is if you go to 32 to 34 degrees, especially with dexmedetomine, it causes bradycardia, and we see bradycardia. But um, but if you really want to knock out shivering, neuromuscular blockade will do it every single time. But um, one of the things you have to be aware of is shivering usually will start kind of at the jawline, and it will move out peripherally. And so this is a scale that was um, validated at Columbia University um, is just a way to kind of quantify uh, the patient's shivering and then um, but this also can give you a stepwise approach of how you might um, deal with the shivering with medications. So all right Emily we've got another polling question. You ready? Yes. Question all number right, two. So I'm launching it now. All right, Emily's launching. All right, so you guys, let me ask you, should we be infusing iced saline after um, return of spontaneous circulation to kind of kickstart cooling? So what do you guys think out there? So who says yes, let's do kick, uh, ice saline, it absolutely works? Who says, nah, the evidence doesn't really support it? Or who says only if you've got it available? So what do you guys think? Should we be doing giving iced saline? Now, one of the studies that was published that I'm going to go over um, in just a few minutes here, they did two liters of four degrees Celsius iced saline. So what do you guys think out there? Does it work? 
Okay, and I'm sharing the results right now. Oh, yeah. Okay, I love it. Yeah. So actually, you guys got it right. No, the evidence doesn't support it. So that's the answer is no, the evidence doesn't support it. Okay, so let's chat about this. So we'll kind of get back to the slide set here, and let's chat about this. All right. So actually, the study that was done evaluating um, saline was done here in Seattle by Francis Kim. So it was done by Francis, published by Francis Kim in 2013. So Francis, I was really lucky to be involved with Francis from the very beginning of his protocols. And so, you know, EMS has kind of always wanted to have a part in this. So what he did was he evaluated, they um, enrolled 1,359 patients into this study. So about 583 experienced a VFib rest, 776 were in a non-shockable rhythm like um, asystole or um, PEA. And and in each group, so he separated them into shockable and non-shockable rhythms, and then he further separated patients into those who got the intervention, which was ice saline, and those who acted as a control. So the control group didn't get an intervention in the field. But to be super clear, everyone got the intervention of cooling once they got to the hospital. So hopefully that makes sense. So they separated out in the field, so EMS, shockable versus non-shockable rhythms and then within those groups they separated into those who got the intervention of isaline and those who acted as a control and so the, the goal was to give two liters of a four degree ice saline in the field. One of the things to note is that almost all of the VFib arrest cases were admitted to the hospital and received cooling, which is, I think, says a heck of a lot about Keegan County and Seattle Medic One and what, what a great job they do. But um, they were able, by giving the ice saline, they were able to get the temperature down by 1.2 degrees Celsius and they decreased the goal to um, target temperature by about an hour. So did it did it work? And when you look at the um, just some kind of specifics, um, about 68% of patients um, got bystander CPR if they were VFib, and about um, about 50% if they were non-shockables. And again, um, when you look at bystander CPR rates, they're the highest in the Seattle area. Um, a lot, you know, look, this is just so impressive. How many of these shockable rhythms retained ROSC or return of spontaneous circulation? Now, that doesn't mean they were discharged. That just means they got them back. But when you looked at um, giving ice saline, it did not. There was no statistical difference. Now, remember, to be statistically significant, the p-value needs to be less than 0.05 and here there was no statistical significance and so um, so saline just didn't seem to quite make a difference so does that mean we should completely give up on any pre-hospital intervention you know to kickstart cooling and I don't think so I think you know there might still be something down the road maybe it's just not saline and I want you guys to think about this if your heart was just in VFib rest I mean think about a heart quivering it's in VFib rest you don't have a pulse or you're in PA or asystole and so you're you have no cardiac output we get you back and then we slam your heart with two liters of crystalloid do you think that might stress the heart and what we found in this study is that actually yes it did because these patients went into pulmonary edema and the other thing was that there was a statistical difference in that patients who got the ice saline had a higher incidence of re-arrest so we think it was maybe the method that we were um, trying to you know kickstart cooling so should we totally give it up I don't think so so I mean I think in the future we probably should look at um, other methods of um, kickstarting cooling, but I don't think saline is the way to go. So, but it's amazing to me, you know, d despite this. Now the AHA has been very specific to say don't do this. It's amazing to me how many facilities still do this. And so I would really question this if you're giving ice saline at your facility for uh, post cardiac arrest patients. Okay. Now kind of the last section I'm going to talk about is. We knew 32 to 34 degrees worked, so we knew it worked. In 2013, there was a study that was published by Dr. Nielsen out of Europe where he said, okay, we know 33 degrees works, but could 36 degrees be superior to 33 degrees Celsius after cardiac arrest? And so um, it was a really interesting study that was done. So let me ask you guys what you guys think. So Emily, you ready to kind of launch this last polling question? I sure am. So here we go. Okay. So I want to know what you guys think. So, so Dr. Nielsen literally compared 33 degrees to 36 degrees. So what do you guys think? So I want you guys to vote. Should we be doing 32 to 34? Is 36 good? Should we do normal thermia? Is maybe a range of 32 to 36 the best way to go? Or do we think that controlling temperature has not been shown to be beneficial?
Because I will tell you, now I'm going to kind of like, this might skew the answers a little bit here. A lot of people misinterpreted this study and came up with the idea that controlling temperature is not beneficial. And this honestly made me very sad um, that people came to that conclusion, but it is super unfortunate. Because one of the problems in research is a lot of people will read the abstract and they don't read anything beyond it. And that is a huge mistake, especially when you're in a hospital and you're in a position of making de clinical decisions. You should always read beyond the abstract. I'm going to go ahead now and close the poll and share the results. And here All they right. come. Yep. What they say... Oh, let's see. Oh, there was a tie. I love this. There was a tie. So um, a tie between stick with hypothermia or 32 to 36. Okay, so here's the deal. So let's get out of this poll and let me explain this to you guys. Okay, so what the study showed, the study showed that 33 degrees was equivalent to um, to 36 degrees. Um, now, a couple things, and this is why, again, you need to read beyond the abstract. Um, about 80% of the patients in this study were v -fibrous. so again, that is the most survivable. Now, one of the things that was fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating, was that a lot of these patients received bystander CPR within one minute. I don't know of any city that receives patients will receive bystander CPR within one minute. That was a bit of a surprise to me, but okay. Um, but So these were, you know, th this was a very survivable group. So anyway, so what he did was he compared 33 degrees to 36 degrees. And I think overall it was a very well-designed study. 36 different hospitals participated in 10 different countries. About a quarter of the patients received um, cooling via catheter, and then about three quarters of the patients received cooling via um, surface. And what he found was no statistical significance um, or difference between the 33 degree degree group versus the 36 degree group. So there was no difference between them. And so we're like, huh, okay, this is really interesting. So there was no difference. Now, remember in those first two studies, they didn't control temperature. So a lot of those patients got febrile who were in the control group. But in this group, they were actually comparing two active interventions. The active intervention of taking the patient down to 33 versus down to 36. And so again, they saw no statistical significantly different or significant uh, difference in neurologic outcomes either. So one of the, there were a couple things that were interesting about this study. Um, let me just kind of show you what AHA is recommending, and then I'm going to kind of show you guys something that I, I know I noticed right away in the study. So what AHA is saying, and the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, is they're saying, um, they're giving a class 3 recommendation to IV fluids, um, uh, meaning don't do it. So class 3 means don't do it. They classified it as no harm, which I think was interesting since there was a statistical uh, difference in rearrest, but they said no harm, class 3. Um, what AHA and LCOR are also saying is that it is a class 1 recommendation based on randomized control trials to cool VFib and VTAC that are out of hospital. Now they also increased the recommendation of non-shockable rhythms and in-hospital cardiac arrest to a class 1. Um, based on expert opinion, which I thought was quite fascinating um, in the 2015 guidelines. Um, again, we've never had a randomized control trial in PEA, asystole, or in hospital cardiac arrest, but it is a class one recommendation based on expert opinion. They're saying go 32 to 36 degrees, um, that's a class one recommendation, and that you should do it, um, you should manage the temperature for a minimum of 24 hours after getting return of spontaneous circulation. And then finally, they also said that you should actively prevent fever in patients who are receiving target temperature management. And I know what we'll do is we'll keep the, um, the device on the patient, ensuring that the patient does not develop a fever because we know fever is detrimental in this patient population. Now, um, a couple things, I put this in your handouts just as an FYI so you'd have it for comparison, but just to kind of show you from a physiologic standpoint, things that we see that are different between 32 to 34 and 36. So you're definitely going to see bradycardia in 32 to 34, not as much with 36, but one of, there was an interesting study published, I think it was about two years ago, showing that if you see bradycardia um, in a patient who's getting cooled, it's actually a good sign, and that was um, a clinical indicator that they are likely to wake up. 
Um, shivering you will see in both patient populations but one of the things in Chris Lux who's the moderator for this session she I just want to call her out as well she's also an expert in this therapy and um, and I'll let her kind of address what they saw in the 36 degree group but we see a ton of shivering in the 36 degree group and it is so challenging because these patients shiver response is intact when you know in a 32 to 34 degree group when you drop below about 30 four degrees, the shiver response is definitely diminished. Um, you don't see as much electrolyte shivering at, at 36 as 32 to 34. Um, drug clearance isn't going to be as big of an issue or is a diuresis. But again, all of these things we see at 32 to 34 are, are all very manageable and they're actually pretty easy to manage to be quite frankly honest. And so now in February of this year, there was a study published, I will tell you, a lot of facilities who jumped and changed to 36 degrees are starting to look at their outcomes now and and that includes the hospital that Chris and I work at but um but Dr. Bernard and Dr. Bray who were um, they published one of those initial papers um, back in 2002 they went to 36 degrees as well so after Nielsen's study they went to 36 degrees and so um, these are their outcomes now what I did was I went ahead and graphed everything you guys see here so let me just show you guys guys. So this was a before and after study. It was not, I don't, I don't believe it was powered to really answer the question, you know, um, is 36 and 33 the same thing? But what they wanted to show is what's happening clinically. And what they're seeing clinically is a decrease in survival once they went to 36 degrees. They're seeing a decrease in hospital survival. And they're also seeing a decrease or decline in neurologic outcomes after going to 36 degrees. So they're not seeing these, you know, the amazing outcomes that were seen, or I shouldn't say amazing, I should say equivalent outcomes that were seen in um, Dr. Nielsen's study um, from 2013. And so now we're all kind of taking a step back and saying, huh, we wonder, you know, is 36 degrees all it's cracked up to be and should we go back to 33 degrees? So one of the things we know is that we should rewarm very, very slowly. So I know in my hospital we, rewarm, we, we will rewarm patients um, over about 12 hours. So it's a very slow rewarming process. So we will rewarm, again, like I said, really, really slowly over about 12 hours. And one of the things we know is if you rewarm too quickly, that that can negate a lot of the benefits that you get from the cooling. So one of the things I wanted to point out was in the in the um, Nielsen trial is they rewarmed their um, 33 degree group on average over six hours. We would never do this. This clinically, this would be a big gigantic no-no for us because we really think that this could actually um, be detrimental to the neurologic outcomes so and I think that's a really big deal and something that you, that we should take note in is that the 33 degree group in that Nielsen study got rewarmed very very quickly and so I kind of wonder if that did negate some of the benefits that would have been seen in a 33 degree group so all right so just to kind of wrap things up what it's going to look like when a patient gets cooled is um, you want to initiate targeted temperature management. And just so you guys know, that is the new term that we're using now is targeted temperature management. So once we started um, recommending 32 to 36 degrees, we got away from the term therapeutic hypothermia and we're now using the term targeted temperature management. And so, um, and, and just so you guys know, TTM is a term that's used for um, managing temperature in all different patient populations. But the whole idea is you initiate it as quickly as possible. You take the temperature down to 32 to 36 degrees for 24 hours, and it's not that you let a patient vacillate between 32 and 36. You pick a temperature in that range and you stick with it for 24 hours. Then you want to rewarm for over at least 12 hours, and then you want to avoid a fever for at least two days. One last thing I want to say is you should really, really um, uh, delay neural prognostication for at least 72 hours. We're seeing delayed wake-ups in a lot of these patients. So, you know, if you kind of go to comfort care and 
withdraw care early, it does become the self-fulfilling prophecy. So we're saying, or AHA is saying, give at least two, uh, 72 hours after therapy um, before you do neuroprognostication. So, so to wrap things up, let me ask you guys this. Does 32 to 34 degrees work? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So we know that 32 to 34 degrees works. Does 36 degrees have the same benefit? According to the Nielsen trial, yes, it does. But others are starting to kind of look at their outcome data and are not seeing the same benefits. Does normal thermia have the same benefit? The answer is we don't know. It's not been studied. However, um, I did look on clinicaltrials.gov. It does look like they're going to be studying normal thermia. Now, I have to say, I, I would... I don't know that I, if I were making a decision at a hospital to be in that study, I don't think that I would be in the study, but that's just me. All right, is fever bad after cardiac arrest? And very likely we think it is, is bad, so we should be avoiding fever. So in conclusion, remember, uh, um, resuscitation is a system of care. Um, oxygen should be normalized. Always ask the question about hemodynamic goals. Should the patient go to the cath lab? Avoid hypotension. And finally, we definitely should be managing temperature, 32 to 36 degrees for at least 24 hours and definitely rewarm very slowly. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Chris Lux, who's going to take questions from the audience. Hey, Chris. Hey, Nicole. Hey, thanks for that very informative presentation. I do have a few housekeeping issues to discuss with the audience before we do the Q&A session. As stated previously, this educational pro program has been approved for one contact hour for both nurses and respiratory therapists by the American Association of Respiratory Care, the California Board of Nursing, and the Florida Bur Board of Nursing. To obtain your continuing education certificate, you will need to go to the website saxtesting.com forward slash SL, which is listed on the slide that is on the screen. You will need to register on the test site and complete the evaluation form. Upon successful submission, you will be able to print your certificate for, of completion. The accreditation statement is disclosed on this slide. The on-demand version will also be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists. Nicole, I am very happy to report that we have lots and lots of questions. Oh no, I'm kind of scared. <laughs> are, are you ready? I'm ready. Well, you're you ready too because just yeah, so you guys, I, Chris, Chris is a huge I, expert in this. I will um I will answer the question that you kind of presented to me uh, during the session. Um, I also worked at Harborview, and after uh, trying to follow in Nicole's footsteps, and uh, when we decided to uh, control temperature to 36 degrees after the Nielsen trial, we were very surprised to see about 25 percent increase in shivering when we did that. Um, more importantly, um, we had an 8% decline in good neural outcomes of 36 degrees versus our outcomes for 33 degrees. And we did attribute that to the increase in shivering for 36 degrees. So we eventually went back to 33 degrees for that reason. So that's the answer to that question. So Chris, what was the decline again? So when you went to 36 degrees, what was the decline? What percentage? Uh, we saw 25% more shivering, and we okay. saw a decline in 8% uh, for good neural outcomes. So, okay. What about overall survival? Um, that was decreased by about 12%, but remember, we have um, a lot of, about 75% of our patients are PEA asystole arrest. Okay. Right. So we thought that was kind of a attributing factor also. Wow. That, but that's, I mean, I think that's a really interesting before and after. It should at least take us to stop and take pause, right? Right. Definitely. Okay. All right. So first question comes from Jason. Can't there be an ST elevation in electrical and physical trauma that the heart suffers from compressions? Yeah. No, there doesn't. Um, a lot of people, yeah, no. So I, I chest compressions in general are not going to cause ST elevation. You might see a bit of a troponin leak maybe, but it's not going to cause a STEMI on your 12 lead. Okay. Next question comes from Igor. Do you look for ST elevation in contiguous leads or ST elevation in any lead? No, contiguous leads for sure, yeah. I mean, because you're asking, does this patient need PCI? Because if you just kind of see generalized ST elevations, you might think pericarditis, you might think cardiac trauma, cardiac contusion. Um, what we're asking is, do we see ST elevation in contiguous leads that that's kind of would give us the idea that this patient needs intervention? 
Okay. PCI. Yeah. All right. The next question comes from Patricia Nicole. When referring to optimal oxygenation greater than 94%, are we looking at arterial direct sats or SpO2? No, it, it, SpO2. Just from a clinically, um, you know, just a clinical ease, um, it'd be SpO2. Okay. This question is a little bit of a longer one. It comes from Mike. In his hospital, they draw ABGs before ROSC. They have to send the ABGs to the lab because they don't have iStats at the bedside. Mike's concern is pushing bicarb during the code. If they don't have a real-time ABG result to determine how much to give, isn't this problematic? Yes, stop pushing bicarb. <laughs> I mean, you know, I always jokingly say the 1980s called, they want their bicarb back, right? You know, so, um, so anyway, yeah, so when should you push bicarb? You should push bicarb if you have an acidosis that caused the code. If you've got an acidosis because of the code, that's not an indication to give bicarb. And I think in, if you look at the guidelines, the guidelines do not suggest routine administration of bicarb. So, so yeah, please stop pushing the bicarb. So I completely agree. But, but I would just refer him back to the, um, to the guidelines and what the guidelines have to say about bicarb. Okay. This next question comes actually from Mary Ann and Perrin. Should rectal probes be used for temperature monitoring during TTM? No. <laughs> I love that question, though. That's a great question. And um, so, no, I mean, no, you need a central core temperature. And um, actually, the... Um, the neurologic, uh, what, the Neural Critical Care Society just came out with their recommendations, and they were very clear to recommend esophageal temperature probes. So um, I think it, it, they they said esophageal or um, bladder probes. Esophageal would be preferred over bladder, but um, but no, rectal tubes they fall out um, if the patient has a bowel. Okay, so sorry guys, we're all nurses and RTs and medical people are here, right? But if they have a bowel movement, I mean, you just lost your your temperature reading, so they're not practical. So no, you should not be using rectal probes. All right. Um, this is from uh, Barbie Ann. She wants to know how does magnesium counteract shivering? Ooh, do you want to address that, Chris? Because that's what, one of the things you implemented. Well, it does have a, it does kind of decrease muscle activity, doesn't it, Nicole? Yeah, it does. And so um, we actually started using it after we went to 36 degrees, um, and so it was uh, it was great. The only problem is that you got to be really uh, careful with people that have any kind of renal insufficiency because um, or uh, liver insufficiency because that their magnesium levels could get way too high. Yeah. Well, and you've also got to watch for hypotension when you, when you give magnesium because it vasodilates. So, um, so that would be the other thing to kind of watch out for. Yeah. But it just de definitely kind of uh, relaxes muscle. Right. All right. Uh, Mary Ann has a really uh, kind of interesting question. How about cooling the patient's head? Not why not have a head-shaped cold pack for oh. EMS? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I mean, maybe for you're saying maybe for EMS to get cooling kickstarted. Yeah, I think that's an it's an interesting idea. Um, now, before these two studies were published in 2002, there was a study that evaluated head cooling alone, and they just didn't see the the statistically significant benefits like they did with. with Full systemic cooling, and so now in kid, and um, especially in neonates, um, you know it it might be reasonable, but in the adult population, it just hasn't worked out. Okay. Next question is from Rob. Uh, is there any evidence to support during uh, during TTM uh, to turn off the ventilator heater humidifier for cooling protocol? Oh yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, I'm trying to think back. I think you. Did, do we turn it off, Chris? I'm just blinking. Do we? No, we didn't. No, we I was didn't. Say, I didn't think we ever did. I was. I don't. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't think we ever did. And in fact, we're doing skin. You know, we're doing. Um, you know, uh, over the skin uh, counter warming. So yeah, I just. I, I know some protocols did because this was kind of a one of those things you're just trying to think of everything to get the patient cooled as quickly as possible. And I know early on some patients did, or I'm sorry, some facilities did turn off the heaters, but I don't. I know we never did. It's just we just didn't see it had an effect. Um, the next question is from Marianne. How often should you perform ABGs during TTM? Oh, I, you know, I don't. I mean. 
as, as often as clinically indicated. Um, you, there's a lot of effects, and you know, again, this is a quick webinar, so you know, I can't go, don't have time to go into all the details, but you definitely have um, shifting on your oxyhemoglobin association curve. So your your cells are going to hold on to oxygen, and patients will get they have a tendency to become more alkalotic because you don't produce CO2. So one of the things I would say is on the induction phase, you definitely should perform, you, you want to make sure you're not blowing off too much CO2 because again that can lead to neurologic um, issues. So um, I would say in the induction phase I would consider doing them a little more frequently but once you get the patient stabilized and they're stabilized on the vent, their temperature stabilized, really the only time you should be doing them is if you have a clinical indication to do so. Is there anything you would add to that Chris? No, I think you completed it pretty well. Um, we have time for one more question. The question's from David. After the rewarming phase, should you continue to control temperature? What temp should you choose and for how long? Yeah, so what the guidelines are saying, I love that question, Dave. It was Dave, you said Dave. I love the question. David, yeah. Oh, David, yeah, and so um, yeah, so what we're doing is keeping them normal thermic, so 37 degrees for at least 48 hours after getting back to goal temperature. So um, yeah, so 37 degrees for at least 48 hours. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for all the very interesting questions you've submitted, but unfortunately our time's up. It's been a pleasure to be your moderator for the webinar, and as always, Nicole, I have learned a lot from your uh, presentation. I hope our audience has too. Emily. I'd like to thank you very much for your time, both Nicole, for this very informative presentation, and as well to you, Christine, for being our moderator today. It's been such a pleasure working with you both, and I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience today, and as well, those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. This does conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.